Dear Lord Jesus, we come here today and it is okay if we are at a loss for words. Sometimes, Lord, when we come to pray, there are things in our minds that we don't know to say or prayers that remain uh, unprayed because we don't know exactly where you're leading us. But you say in Ephesians chapter 2, 10, that we are here to do those good works prepared in advance for us to do. And we don't always have all the answers. And it's times like that that we just need to listen. So Lord, I pray that you would uh, take the stoppers from our ears, that you would remove the blinders from our eyes and the wax from our hearts so that we could hear you, that we would, for a moment, um, put aside our requests, although you always want to hear them, but today we just want to listen. So Holy Spirit, will you convey to us the heart of God? Will you speak to us the will of our Father who is in heaven and to help us orient and direct our lives to the affairs of kingdom building? We want to hear you. We want to hear what's on your mind, God. We want to listen to you as children listen to their Father. So Holy Spirit of the living God, now come and just make our minds clear to receive what God has to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we spoke of Paul uh, being both in prison and being a prisoner of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he was compelled and and drawn by Jesus Christ to stop persecuting the church. And oddly enough, he was chosen by Jesus to be the evangelist, to be the messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, to us. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 16b to 9 says this, I, this is Paul speaking, pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts would be flooded with the light so that you can understand the wonderful future he has promised to those he called. I want you to realize what a rich and glorious inheritance he has given to his people. I pray that you'll begin to understand the incredible greatness of his power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Paul was a prisoner compelled to share the gospel of Jesus Christ because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead was at work in his own heart. That it was no longer Paul that lived, but Christ that lived in Paul. He was absolutely compelled. He, he, his, his heart was absolutely broken for the church in Ephesus. He was compelled. As a prisoner for the Lord, I urge you, Paul says, to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit to the bond of peace. As a, as a prisoner, those of us who have received Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we talked about this last week, have 
in us the Spirit of God so that we don't just come to church. We are the church. I am compelled, Paul said, to disciple you so that you don't just merely become saved, but that you become like Jesus. I am compelled to to help you grow in your maturity. I pray for you every day, he said, to to build you into this Christ-like expression so that you don't just come to church, so that you continue the ministry of Jesus Christ. Eugene Peterson wrote a paraphrase version of the Bible. This is how he puts it, verses 4, 1 to 3. In light of all this, in light of the fact that Jesus Christ died for the church in Ephesus, died for you, to give you a second chance, in light of all this, here's what I want you to do. While I'm locked up in here, a prisoner for the master, I want you to get out there and walk. Better yet, run on the road God called you to. I don't want any of you sitting around on your hands. I don't want anyone strolling off down some path that goes nowhere. And mark that you do this with humility and discipline, not in fits and starts, but steadily pouring yourselves out for each other in acts of love, alert at noticing differences and quick at mending fences. Run the race! Eugene Peterson tells us. Don't walk the race. Don't wander off on some strange path that leads you nowhere. Don't sit around on your hands. Don't just come to church. Be the church. When we saw that video of, of, of the guys in Haiti, I mean, when you say it was 30 How hot did you say it was? 35 degrees? I think it was hotter than that. It was hot. And I saw grown men, you know, weeping for kids that had no parents. Scott, do you remember that dance? How did that go again? Do you remember that? Did you you practice that? Yeah. We should get him up here to do the dance, but he, he won't do that for us. Do you, you know the words, don't you? <laughs> you know, uh, those men didn't sit on their hands. They didn't follow odd paths that lead to nowhere. They ran the race to do the good works prepared in advance for them to do. These men were the church. This is what Paul is calling the church in Ephesus to do. I I think Paul was telling the church in Ephesus that Christianity was not to be lived out on the sidelines. It's not a spectator sport. It's for participants. For those people who have Christ burning inside of them, like Paul says, that for him to, to die would be to gain because he could be with Jesus, but, but to live would be for your sake, to lead you into a deeper relationship with Christ. I think Paul was, was, was telling us that, that the Great Commission is in fact a commission. It is, in fact, marching orders. You know the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Surely I am in you, living through you, church, to the very end of the age. Go and 
make disciples. Don't just come to church. Be the church. Disciple. When these kids, like think about these kids in Haiti. They are still being discipled by us. We built the water treatment plant for them or contributed greatly to it. Hope we didn't break too many things, but, but we did. So those kids that we saw baptized, they're still being discipled by our prayers. The pastor who was baptizing them, I spent quite a bit of time praying with him. The work that we did as a church is continuing on even today. Francis Chan, you know, he wrote uh, Crazy Love and Forgotten God. We, we, we studied some of these books a year ago. In one of his, uh, one of his uh, conferences that he has called Verge, he uses an example of telling his daughter to clean her room. So he says, daughter, go clean your room. So the daughter goes away. The daughter comes back and says, guess what, dad? I memorized everything you said. Go clean your room. Or rather, go clean your room. But her room remained unclean. He says that at some level in church, when we come to church, we study the word, which is good. Study the word. We pray with each other. Yeah, that's a really good thing to do. We memorize scripture, which is excellent. Memorize scripture. But unless you put it into action, you're simply coming to church. You're not being the church. And in, it's the difference between fishing and catching. And Brother Lou, I'd rather be catching any day. When you work to see and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit working through you, when you, when you dare to say to God, I'm going to stop talking for a moment, and I'm going to start listening. I'm asking you now to direct my affairs so that I do those good works prepared in advance for me to do. I want to be the church. I want to be the church. I want to be actively engaged in extending the kingdom of God. This was the message to the church in Ephesus. And guess what? The proof is in the pudding because they put the temple of Diana out of business. And the gospel was spread all through Asia. It's the difference between reciting clean your room and actually going and cleaning your room. It's the difference between fishing and catching. It's the difference between studying about Jesus and being like Jesus. The Greek word for church is ecclesia. You've, you, that word's all over the place. You've, you've, you've seen it. But it's made up of two words. The prefix is, is ek, which means out, and koleo, which means to call, so called out. Ecclesia simply means called out. Those, those people, those people who have received Jesus Christ as their personal Savior are the church of which Christ is the head, we are called out. Called out to do those good works, prepared in advance for us to do. Paul was writing a letter to people who once worshipped idols, He's writing it from the perspective of a man whose once sole purpose in life was to arrest and even kill Christians. He was a demonstration to them the kind of power and the presence that the Spirit of God can do when Jesus inhabits a person's life. When Paul became the church. He was saying to these people the very same call that he had, they have. That 
that the call is an act of partnership. And that call goes out today. Do you get it? We read about the Apostle Paul. We understand that he was a really bad guy. He plotted to have Christians harmed, arrested, and even murdered. And now, he's the one chosen by God to go and share the gospel with Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. If there's hope for Paul, there's hope for us. Ecclesia, called out, adopted, grafted in to the family of God. The Jews had the original covenant. Now we're grafted in, molded in, heirs to the kingdom of God. That's why he says, I want you to grow up. I want you to realize the rich inheritance, the, the fabulous inheritance that God has called you to. I want you not just to be saved, I want you to be the church. That message resonates today. It's the mango story all over again. What's the fruit of a mango? A mango tree. You know, when, when we disciple someone, when we share our faith with someone, it's not just one soul saved. That soul is planted and the tree grows and many, many more souls are saved. Every time Krista it, it leads a child to the Lord in Sunday school, we have an entire lifetime of mango trees. You know, far out doing anything we've done. One of the guys that, that I have spent some time discipling, Shane, whose name shall remain nameless, the other day in the parking lot, here's this mango tree, praying for me. And I'm going, wow, this discipling relationship is over. This man's now a tree. It's, he's a tree. He's leading people to the Lord. That's what it's like when we share our faith with someone, when, when the Holy Spirit resonates inside of us, and, and those, brother, those of us who are Christians, we know this, right? I mean, I'm not, we're not making anything up here. It burns in us to share our faith. We can't not do it. We are prisoners to this. It's, it's, it's the most compelling thing that a true follower of Jesus Christ will experience is the desire to see people saved so they don't go to hell. So that they have a life that is worth living. John 10.10 10 says the thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. We see all that. We get that message. All you have to do is walk out the door and you'll see that. But Jesus says, I've come to give you life and to give it more abundance. We are, we are here to plant mangoes, fruit. Now, we're going to switch a little bit here. John chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. Jesus put it this way. This is, these are the words of, of our master. This is the way he interprets church. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that does not produce fruit. He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they will produce even more. You have already been pruned for greater fruitfulness by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful apart from me, apart from me inhabiting you. There is no fruit. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I am them will produce fruit. Not might, not perhaps. They will produce fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who parts from me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile and burned. But if you stay joined to me and my words remain in you, you may ask me for any request you like and it will be granted. My true disciples produce much fruit. This brings great glory to my Father. This is what Cyril was telling us when he introduced the prayer room that answered prayer 
for those of us who are engaged in kingdom building, is a for sure deal. I'm not talking about Mercedes Benz or that kind of stuff. When God puts something on your heart to do those good works prepared in advance for us to do, Jesus prunes us and molds us and shapes us and it's a little painful and it hurts sometimes. But at the end of the day, we become more like Christ. The ecclesia is the church, this expression of the, of the body of Christ called out of the world and then sent back into the world to be like Jesus. Ecclesia, that's who we are. As Paul puts it, we are prisoners to the gospel. We, you know, if you don't know this message, this, you may just think I'm a crazy person. You don't get that. But I'm saying to you, church, that, that if you're sensing that there's more to this Christian experience, there is. There is. Lord, I acknowledge that I am a prisoner to the gospel. I can't turn it off. It is in my bones. It is so deeply ingrained in me that I can't turn it off even if I wanted to. I don't always do things right. The church in Ephesus didn't always do things right. They weren't perfect. They didn't, they didn't become Christians and then they were instantly like neat and cool. The church is messy and it's chaotic. People grow and they make mistakes. But this is one thing. Remember we said, what, what, if Paul had a life verse, this might be it. Philippians 4. For I can do everything with the help of Christ who gives me the strength that I need. For I can do everything with the help of Christ who gives me the strength that I need. Anyone who believes in me will do what I've been doing. In fact, he'll do even greater things than these because I'm going to be with the Father. Ask me for anything in my name and I'll give it to you the glory of the Father. This is the kind of prayer, this is the kind of gusto, this is the kind of expression of ecclesia that God wants to call his church into. Oh, it's great to come to church, and it's great to sing. It's, a, um, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I love to do that. But in the first century church, that, that might have been a foreign concept. Might have been. I, I don't read anywhere where Jesus says, come to church. Oh, he says, don't forsake the gathering of one another, and that's very important. But if we have reduced church, ecclesia, to coming to church on Sundays, it's like Francis Chan says, we study all about cleaning the room. We memorize the books and we memorize and we pray, we do all those things. But unless we're actually engaged in kingdom building, we're not really the church. And I think what's happening is, at least in my life, that's what I'm hearing. These days, when I pray, I'm doing much less talking and a way more listening. I hope that's happening to you. That, that you're getting these messages that, that Jesus is saying. Go into the world and be like me. And don't be afraid to share your faith because guess what? what? What did we learn? We learned that the Holy Spirit goes way ahead of us. There's an ark. Oh, the, the, they're all way ahead of us. Oh, we got to do show up. What? Nobody comes to the Father, Jesus says, unless he is drawn. And so when we engage the world as Christians, Know full well that God has gone ahead of us. And this is the message. This is the message that Paul is telling the church in Ephesus. Go, Ecclesia. Go into the world and preach the gospel. Even if you're not perfect. Ministry 
is what happens when you're waiting for ministry to happen. When you're waiting for God to kind of straighten things out in your life or to correct you or to whatever it is, that, those are the very times that your life is transparent and God is using you to speak Christ into somebody else. He's using you to be the church. Ministry is what happens when you're waiting for ministry to happen. I have never met a perfect Christian. There's no such thing. Paul certainly was not perfect. He was, uh, I guess we could call him a murderer. At least he was an accomplice as a murderer. And he would, by today's laws, he would certainly be charged as a murderer. Christians are not perfect. You are not perfect. Uh, I, I believe Paul's life is saying to the church, don't wait to get your stuff in order before you start ministry. Just start doing it. Start being like Christ right away. Even Paul, this, the, perhaps the, the greatest theologian in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 25, this is what he says about himself. I don't understand myself at all, he says. I really want to, for what I really want to do, what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. I know perfectly well that what I'm doing is wrong and my bad conscience shows that I agree that the law is good, but I can't help myself because the sin inside me makes me do these evil things. In other words, there are times in my life when I'm out of control. This is Paul talking, even as a born-again believer. I know that I am rotten through and through. So as far as my old sinful nature is concerned, no matter which way I turn, I can't make myself do what I want to do. I just can't, dot, dot, dot. Oh, what a miserable person am I. Who will free me from this life that is so dominated by sin? Who will rescue me from this pollution that exists within me? Thank God the answer is Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank God there's the gospel. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's laws, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. In the same, ver in the same breath that he can say, I am a slave to the gospel, he can say, I am a slave to sin because the old dead Paul still remains deep inside, implanted in him, causing him to doubt that God is truly directing his way. So he says, so he has to come out and say this. So there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from sin and death. Christian, you need to know this, that as God is calling you to be the church, Satan will throw everything he can at you. You will feel like such a loser. He will remind you of all of your stuff. And guess what? Satan has a great memory. And at some level, the memories are so pronounced, so strong, that you actually believe them. And if it wasn't for the fact that Paul knew that there's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, he couldn't do it. He totally gets it, that he was a murderer. He was a bad guy. A really bad guy. He totally gets it that, that if it was given to his own devices, if it wasn't for the fact that the Spirit of God took up residence in him, he certainly would continue to do the things he didn't want to do. Because at that point, he was a slave to sin. But now that he is a prisoner in prison and a prisoner of the gospel, he is a prisoner to life. He is a prisoner to, to say, I would rather go home to be with Jesus but for Christ's sake, I'll stay here with you so that you can see, I can help you, I can disciple you, I will teach you everything that Jesus has taught me, everything that God has taught me, so that you will grow to be strong and wise in the way and you will become a mango tree. Not just saved, a mango tree. If all we do is save you in this church, we're not doing our job. And we're not doing you any favors. Ministry is what happens when you're waiting to get your stuff in order. When you're waiting for things to come together. Course corrections. 
this is hard. This is hard for me to say. Hey, put yourself in these, in these positions and see what God says. Be completely humble and gentle. How many of us are completely humble and gentle all the time? We're not. But it's what we shoot for. And it's what the Spirit leads us to, and it's where God is building us, and that's the character of Christ that over time will come out in our lives most of the time, but not all the time. Philippians chapter 2 says, don't, or verses, Philippians chapter 2 verses uh, 3 to 7 says this, don't be selfish, don't live to make a good impression on others, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself, don't think only about your own affairs, but be interested in others too, and what they are doing. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not demand and cling to his rights as God. He made himself nothing. He took the humble position of a slave and appeared in human form. There's no uh, hierarchy in the kingdom of God. There's no better Christians and less better Christians. There's no more saved Christians and less saved Christians. There's only growing Christians. There's only those of us, I, I suppose you could be walking away from God, in which case you'd be a backslidden Christian, but that's for another sermon. There's no low-hanging fruit. There's no... There's none of us who are less than others. To, to be like Christ is to emulate the character of Paul when he says that I'd rather be home with Jesus when I'm making a conscious choice to stay here, to serve Christ, to disciple you. To die is to gain, he said. The church, us, the ecclesia, for as long as we are here on the face of this earth, God is asking us to consider others as more valuable than us. so that our lives get poured out in not just saving people's souls, but in planting mangoes. So that our children, so that the people that we lead to the Lord aren't just buying an insurance policy against hell, which they are, I guess, but that they have that same burning desire to see others come to the Lord that we do. That they won't be able to turn that off. That they will, in fact, outpace us. That they won't just walk through their Christian life, like Eugene Peterson says. They'll run through it. Yes! I can pray for this person or this thing that God has put on my heart. I can pray for Windsor Park. I can pray for people I don't know yet. The only people we don't know are friends we haven't made yet. That's what a salesman will tell you. Right, Dave? But there is, in the prayer room today, we, are, we, were, we were compelled to pray for Windsor Park. We were compelled. Why? Because God put Windsor Park on our, on our hearts. And, and, and he's going to give us opportunities to put Windsor Park above our own needs, wants, and desires. He's going to give us an opportunity to be like Christ to Windsor Park or to your boss or to your husband or wife who's not a Christian or whatever. But he's going to give us a chance, an opportunity to be like Jesus, to, to be completely humble and gentle even though it's against our own nature. Now, some of you are better at that than others. Some of you find that easier to do, but most of us won't find it that easy to do, to actually give up what is rightfully ours to somebody else. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. 
with one another in love. A new command, John chapter 13, verse 34 says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The, the way that the world will see Christ, the way that they'll witness our testimony is the way that we love each other. And that's hard to do because even in this situation with Paul and Barnabas, they were at each other fighting. Two believers love the Lord, but they had to fight. If you want to read the story about John Mark, go right ahead. But, but they, they, they fought each other, and that happens in a church. But, at the, but we mend fences. We stop and we show people that at the end of the day that even though we can be different and, have, and even our theologies can be slightly different, or, but at the end of the day we make mistakes, but we make allowances for each other's mistakes. It's kind of like getting a get-out-of-jail-free card. Oh yeah, everybody's going to make a mistake. We're going to say things. We're even going to sin. But at the end of the day, the world will see the kind of love that Christ has for them by the kind of love that we have for each other even if it hurts. We put others ahead of ourselves. We're, we're patient with each other, hopefully. At the, you know, we come to that conclusion that if God loves that person so much, I guess I can tolerate them too. And finally, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Irene. Peace. Band up. That it's it's interesting if you uh, if you look to what the literal definition in the Greek says on some of these words. The word peace, as it's used here, the the tightest definition that I could find is simply this. To set at one again. To make whole. To set at one again. Ephesians 4 verse 4 says, There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is, all, who is over all and through all and in all. To keep the bond of peace means to establish and work at maintaining unity within Ecclesia. To stay close together knowing full well that we will make mistakes. Knowing full well that we have to abide with one another's mistakes, foibles, and sins. And to put them ahead of our own free will even though we may have a right. We're willing to let go of that right. When the world sees that, it's a very different expression of humanity. It's, it's, it's not the humanity that's fallen. It's not, it's not the Adam humanity. It's the healed, second Adam humanity of Christ. When they can see the kind of love that we share for each other, it's something that they don't have. It's something that they will want. And, and, to, and to cap it off, the very same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the very same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive in each one of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Oh, we, we still have that memory like Paul had. You know, Paul said, I don't do the things I do want to do and I do the things I don't want to do. Sometimes I'm out of control. That's what Paul said. That's what he said. But he also said there's therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And somehow, putting those two together, he could say, I know that God will empower me, enable me to do whatever he calls me to do. That he won't leave me hanging. And so when we go to pray, when we listen to God, when, when, when God says to us, Go to this place and do this thing. Call this person and pray for this person. Go, go and be like Christ in this place. And he will, and he does, because we have these good works prepared in advance for us to do, knowing full well that we are absolutely imperfect and prone to sin. But he forgives us anyhow. That empowers and enables us to love on and to forgive the person next to us who, may, who is in every likelihood just like we are, imperfect, 
and wrecked. And during that whole chaotic process of growing in the Lord, establishing the inheritance that he's given us all, is ministry. It's ministry. That's when we are the most effective at reaching a fallen world for Christ while we are growing. Ministry is what happens when you're waiting for ministry to happen. It's what happens when you grow in Christ. There's one body, one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. The church. Lord, I I understand that this, this may be hard for some of us to understand or to accept. That all the years that we uh, maybe have been trained to simply come to church. And although that's not bad, it's not a bad thing. But Paul, when he, when, when he wrote the church in Ephesus, he said, I want you to be more than, than just that. I want you to understand the depth and the width of the inheritance that you've actually been called to. And then I want you to partner with me in sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in authentic, real ways as Ecclesia to the rest of the world. And Lord, that falls to us now today. There's one God, one hope, one Christ. And we all share that. In Jesus' name.